Welcome back for the second of our two keynote presentations. I have the distinct pleasure of standing next to one of our uh, founding fathers of the ACI community, <laughs> within the grandfathers, <laughs> founding grandfathers, uh, within the information systems uh, community, as we have been discussing this over the past few months, information systems minded HCI scholars, Dr. Isaac Bambasat. Um, everyone knows Isaac's work, uh, who's in the room here today. Uh, of course, he's also served as past president of the association. He's served as, um, uh, he actually was recently, uh, he entered the Order of Canada, uh, which is a, <laughs> the most prestigious recognition one can receive in Canadian context. And uh, he's one of the few IS scholars that has broken that 100 barrier on the H index for anyone who cares, but he's done it, so there you go. And uh, more importantly, He's really uh, put forth many ideas that have inspired many of us, most, if not most of us, in our own research. Uh, in the past, uh, he, Isaac has contributed also some papers on the directions. So I, think, I can think back to a 2010 piece on so the future of HCI for our community. So uh, to, it's now 2022. So it's, uh, it's very timely to revisit and building on, on the great talk by Elizabeth on what Isaac sees as that yesterday, today, and tomorrow for HCR research for MIS professors specifically. So with that, uh, please um, join me in welcoming Isaac Bebasad to SIG HCR workshop. Thank you. Can you hear me in the back with the microphone? Uh, thank you, Elizabeth, uh, for the great talk. And I think your talk is kind of a nice intro for mine. We are going to cover a few things, but not too many. There are a few overlaps. Let me tell you a little story, not about HCI, but about Mark Twain. How many people have heard of Mark Twain? Famous uh, American author, writer of Huckleberry Finn, uh, Tom Sawyer's Adventures, and so on. Apparently, he was a great speaker, a uh, very amusing speaker, but he was very reluctant. And uh, he was invited for after-dinner speeches, like keynote speeches. And uh, he used to tell the story. In the old days, during the Roman uh, Empire times, they would be prosecuting the Christians at that time, and in fact, throwing them to the lions. Terrible, in the big arenas with the gladiators and so on and so forth. And one day, they uh, bring this poor fellow, uh, tie him to the stake in the middle of the big uh, Colosseum, and uh, the ferocious lion is let out. The lion is hungry, hasn't been fed for a while, charges towards the, the poor guy, hide there, and the fellow says something to the lion. The lion stops, turns around, goes back into his cage, and everybody is bewildered. The emperor says, bring this fellow to me here, up in the stands there, and he says, if you tell me what you told the lion, I'm going to grant you your life. And the poor guy says, well, I told the lion, if he ate me, he had to give an after-dinner speech. <laughs> so, I'm really a reluctant speaker. The last keynote I gave was about 10, uh, no, 20 years ago. <clears throat> Ended up uh, in a commentary in the MIS quarterly about the identity crisis, together written with Bob Smart. And a lot of people got irritated with me. So I hope today I'm not going to do that and we'll have a nice conversation. So when the SIG board uh, invited me, uh, I was a bit reluctant, but happy to join. So I would like to thank uh, Konstantinos, Eric Lim, uh, Chiwi Tan, both of them used to be my students, and Mark uh, for this nice invitation. Uh, let me start with a definition, uh, Elizabeth had a very nice definition, uh, but my definition is a bit different. It's what we've got here is a failure to communicate. Now, if there are any film buffs here, you would know that this is from a 1967 movie by Paul Newman. This is being uttered by the sadistic Warren, and Paul Newman doesn't listen, and he gets all the punishment. A highly rec recommended movie. But a more uh, serious note, here is the definition, which is very similar to the one that uh, Elizabeth mentioned uh, a while ago. Now, 
My talk is built around 10 uh, conjectures. I hope you have time to cover all of them. If I can't, then they'll have to invite me to come next year. <laughs> but what are these conjectures? Just my personal opinions, half-baked ideas. Some of them will be familiar. I think some of them you will agree. Maybe some you won't agree. Conjecture one, in the past we tried to understand how to interact with computers. Now computers try to understand us. Let me take the first part of that sentence. Uh, my memory is, uh, you can see me on the right-hand side trying to read this uh, punch paper tape uh, in a ill-sitting uh, bag uh, baggy suit. But uh, really my first interaction with computers was, I don't think I had any interaction with the computers because I was dealing with punch cards. And this wasn't the only medium that you had in terms of, there, was, there were no terminals at the time. Maybe if there were, uh, I wasn't using them as a student at the University of Minnesota. But you also had to use to write a program. And you needed the medium, you know, we put the program on the punch cards, we fed that into the computer, three hours later something came back, or didn't come back, sometimes a very thick output came, it was an infinite loop, and you wasted a lot of paper. So, the bad old days, we didn't have too much in terms of uh, human-computer interaction. The dinosaurs, as you can see in that uh, little cartoon. But about 15 years later, uh, mid-80s, these computers, the so-called personal computers, started appearing. The IBM one, when I was Bauer Fellow at the Harvard uh, Business School in 85, 86, the home business school, the Baker Library, was full of them. I had one in my office. I really didn't like it. This was an ugly device. I really didn't like it at all. But then the Apple Macintosh came out at the same time, and this was a beautiful device. I liked it. My wife liked it. And it created a brand new kind of direct manipulation interface. I found direct manipulation. In fact, they, I don't want to, I know what the right word is, they copied something from the Xerox stuff, but they made it popular. So now we started talking about some interesting stuff in human-computer interaction, and now we come to today from the very large computers, the uh, uh, picture that Elizabeth showed where the humans were, a small piece of a large computer center, now the computers fit into our pockets, and the other thing that is small is the users are being small. So, in a way we can say, uh, there was a book by Francis Fukuyama about the end of history, Maybe we can say the end of the basic level of uh, human-computer interaction is resolved. That's my opinion. Let me come to conjecture number two. Uh, in HCI IS, I mean HCI as practiced by people, let's say in this room in the IS area, is really not about human-computer interaction. Because we are not interacting with computers, we are really interacting with other things and I'll mention what they are, through a portal as a, com a computer interface. So let's uh, look at an example. <clears throat> this is um, our UBC e-commerce research program. We started almost 20 years ago, and it's coming to an end uh, as I move into retirement. Uh, it looks something like this. We have a, a person uh, trying to do some shopping online. And I will call this human-computer interaction. The person is interacting with the computer to achieve a purchasing a transaction, but in fact the person really is interacting with a company. And uh, I'll call this customer uh, company communication. Not only that, within the company we have products, the person is interacting with them, there is service, service per personnel, uh, this lady is interacting with them, there are social networks, there are people who are writing reviews, and there are recommendation agents. So the interaction, the important interaction, is not at this beginning level, but at the level that comes after that. Now, what I call the interaction part, human-computer interaction, is necessary for the success of the whole enterprise, but it's not sufficient to have a successful e-commerce experience. Now, what is this e-commerce experience? Well, I look at it, no, we look at it in terms of reducing uncertainties. That's the objective. What are the uncertainties? 
well, I'm going to buy a product, and I'm not certain about if it's the right product. So I need to know a bunch of things about this particular product. Well, uh, one thing is I need to understand the product itself, the description of the product, uh, in terms of the form and functionality. I need to know about its performance here. Maybe I'm relying on people who write reviews, experts, or uh, wisdom of the crowds. I use a recommender system, an advisor, who will tell me if the product fits me, so that's the fit uncertainty reduction. Uh, there is a social fit, maybe my social network tells me if this product is the right one in terms of style and my personality. Then there are the post-purchase uncertainties, the product doesn't arrive on time, etc., etc. Uh, all of these are helpful. Now, how does this help us with human-computer interaction? Well, I'll, I'll look at the product side only. Uh, I think my student, Jack Jiang, is someplace here. Uh, for his doctoral thesis, um, he uh, did an interesting study. And we said, in product understanding, the objective is to understand the form and the function. But then you need some functionality, so if you want to call affordances, and from these affordances, uh, the interaction, the interface elements will be derived. So we said, well, maybe we use a direct manipulation interface where you can click on the different parts of the product, the, the buttons and so on, and if it's a watch, it lights up or it, it rings a bell or, or whatever it does, you can also rotate this thing and you can get uh, an understanding. So a direct manipulation interface. Well, if we were doing it today, maybe we'll do it with virtual reality. That would be another kind of interface. But that we could also use a video. Sometimes we find a video descri uh, description of the product form and functionality. Or you can use a written description. So here, uh, to get to HCI, or to get to the interaction part, I'm not really relying on any general principles about HCI. I'm really uh, looking at very objective functional approach to come up with the HCI. So that's the point I'm trying to convey at this level. Now, the next uh, point which really directly follows is most HCI, uh, ISHCI studies do not really test HCI theories. Uh, I know Elizabeth mentioned some of the theories from the old days. I also use the GAMS models, etc., etc., or humans as information processes, cognitive limitations. But I don't think we are testing these these days. So let me show an example from my research. Now, I'm going back now 15 years. So this is 15 years ago, we are thinking about this question. How do we make sure that the recommendations of an advice-giving system are, are accepted? So we say, okay, there is a theory about trust. Uh, if I trust you more, I will accept your recommendation. That's pretty straightforward. And then what do we do? Well, let's think about the method and I will use a design-based approach. I will design something and test it in the lab. So how do I design it? Well, there is something called a cognitive appeal. In other words, I can provide explanations and transparency about this advice-giving system. You look at the explanations, you understand how it's working, you say, ah, oh, this makes sense. I trust it, I will accept the recommendation. Or we can use what I call a social appeal. Uh, we can based it on the computers are social actors paradigm, but we go a level deeper and said not only making, making it human-like or putting it an avatar, but we are going to create similarity. The opposite will be dissimilarity. I mean, there's similarity, attraction, dissimilarity, repulsion theories from social psychology. So we are going to create entities, computer entities, that are similar to me, the user. Now, how do we do that? Uh, well, we can do it in many different ways. We can come up with some, but the way we did it is we say, well, I can be similar to you, to the computer element or the entity, the advice giving system. We have the same demographics. <coughs> we have the same personality, and we think in the same way about solving this particular issue. Okay, now how do I translate this into HCI design? Well, one was we used avatars. Now, in demographics, we said, in our design, we'll have a by two by two design. It will be uh, gender and ethnicity of the machine. 
and gender ethnicity of the user. We'll try to match this. Well, uh, the avatar is a front end to asking you questions, giving you answers. It's really the front end to the recommendation system that creates the sense of similarity. Uh, we use speech act theory to create a verbal communication where the advice giving system talk to you in a dominant way or in a submissive way. We try to match this with the personality of the user. And finally, on the thinking side, we looked at uh, preferential choice strategies. There are elimination strategies. I may be using it, the computer uses it, then there is a fit or additive difference, uh, whatever. So we take this to the test, the design and test approach. My preference is experiments, lab or online experiments. And at the end, where are the practical implications coming from? Well, they really follow easily uh, from the treatment designs. If demographic similarity has worked and created trust, then we are in business, then we can put avatars that are similar to the user. But the more interesting issue is the next one. <clears throat> Whose theory are we testing? Now, if you think about it for a moment, did I test any theories in HCI? No, I didn't. What was the theory? It was similarity, dissimilarity theories. Where does it come from? Social psychology. So what's happening here? We are using theories to apply it to practical designs in human-computer interaction. Do we care? That's a question that you need to answer. I mean, I've written papers about that we don't have our own theories, etc. But I think this is a reflection of the reality. And if you think about the researchers you have mentioned today and you are doing, whose theory are testing? That's a, a, something that you should keep in mind. Next conjecture, following from this design notion, HCI researchers are or should be design scientists, but not all design scientists are HCI researchers. Uh, this was brought to me, uh, to my attention by Konstantinos, uh, was it a week or two weeks ago? He said, do you know they mentioned you in a blog? I said, I don't touch these things, I don't, I don't like social media. They are evil. Uh, but, uh, I don't know, is Jan Record here? I guess. No, he's not here. So Jan Record, some of you might know, Nick Varent and Shirley Gregor, established, distinguished people. Uh, I believe they were all our currently uh, senior editors of the quarterly. And this is what they say. We wonder whether uh, more, people write, uh, more people write about design science than actually doing design science, and why, and here is the kicker, Isaac Bambasat might be the most successful design scientist of all time. Now, it's not only this week, but of all time. Uh, I'm sure Dennis Galetta is back there. He says, is this really true? <laughs> Clearly, I showed you that I am using design, I'm testing design, it's a nice approach. But if you ask maybe Alan Havner or some other design scientist, I don't know. I don't want them to uh, uh, grab me in the hallway and kick me because of, uh, <laughs> I'm not making the play. But another thing, uh, I, I see in a lot of your presentations, there is a design element. I think there is some benefit in approaching it that way. Now, Conjecture one said that, well, you know, we dealt with interaction, we don't uh, have to worry about interacting with computers. This is a bit different. This talks about intentions. Now, what am I talking about? This is who knows what evil lurks in the minds of computers. Now, I don't think there's anyone old enough here to figure out where this quote is coming from. In ideas. Dennis, no ideas. There was a famous serial in the 1940s radio, it was called the shadow. And the beginning would say, who knows what evil lurks in the minds of men? The shadow knows. So I'm talking about a range of different types of system from the truthful to the defective, to the bias, uh, Aaron talked about it, to the persuasive, and to the deceptive. I think some of you talked about deceptive systems. The question is, how do we help the user figure this thing out? And it's a very interesting question, it's a very difficult question. Now, explanations, uh, I think I'll talk about explanations later. I don't know if 
there were any papers about the explanation, I think there were one or two here today, that could be one solution. I figure out what's inside, what is happening. The approach we use is a bit different. Uh, what Wes Churchman, who um, passed away a number of years ago, professor at Berkeley, was kind of a philosopher, and he talks about these Hegelian approaches, which means you bring a couple of, or maybe two or three different uh, sources, it could be recommender systems, that are fighting with each other, approaching the problem from different points of view. In our research, for example, we provide advice from recommendation agents, from experts, from consumers, and when there is a clash between them, how does the user deal with it? But the fact that there is a clash makes you aware that you shouldn't be accepting a single source without carefully thinking about it. I think this is an important problem. I mean, a lot of people are dealing with fake news. This is a bit different. Here we are talking about an advice giving system. Now, the kind of symmetric side is HCI design is about understanding who, where, what the users are and what their intentions are. This is on the computer side. So, a lot of different examples here. And this quotation uh, from a recent paper, I think it was in uh, our transactions, uh, the next level of human-centered AI should be to, to reason the intentions of the users and act in an adaptive, intelligent manner, and this is going to lead to trust. Kind of a nice, very noble idea. I, I can't disagree with it, but I worry about it from this point of view. Uh, do we want computers to understand us when, why, and who made this decision that computers should understand us and uh, act in that way? All of you are familiar with the uh, privacy calculus, I and mean, there's a cost-benefit analysis. Most of the time, we agree on it. There is intrusiveness. My Apple Watch keeps buzzing from time to time. You know, wake up now, stand up now, mm -hmm. read now, do this now. It's very intrusive. And lastly is the issue of control. Who is in control of this? And I'll talk about the control in a second again. Uh, conjecture 7 says, ignoring the physical, uh, maybe it's a key omission. Now, here we are going into the realm of robotics. Uh, when uh, we looked at the survey results, some of you participated in the survey that Constantino uh, sent, and I looked at the literature in ISHCI, there is very little mention of robotics. Uh, I can understand that because the, the physical aspect of creating a robot, a robot and so on and so forth, you know, maybe it's outside our areas of expertise. Uh, so robots are becoming more human-like, but not as human-like as uh, this uh, famous actress, uh, Alicia Vikander, who is an Oscar winner, uh, from a movie called Ex Machina. How many of you have seen this? If you haven't, it's highly recommended because it's all about artificial intelligence and robotics. And you can see the name of this robot called Ava, which is Eve, the first of its kind. And, uh, you know, are these sentient beings? Uh, this computer programmer is sent to uh, evaluate this robot to make sure if the robot has consciousness or not, etc. Beautiful movie. And uh, the last issue of um, a month ago of The Economist is talking about this issue. And there are interesting studies now. People are studying if the face of the robot, the dimensions, and so on, is going to make a difference in terms of aesthetics, etc., etc. Now, we talked about the physical aspect of it. But, uh, oh, yeah, I'd like to mention this. You can buy these little robots for 32 bucks. I think for Christmas gift for your uh, children. This is 32 Canadian. The battery is included. If you are wondering, this is like $2, 2 euro, euros. So Canadian dollar is stock. <laughs> uh, recently, I've seen some research where the physical and the cognitive are being combined. Uh, here, I'll put this quotation up. <coughs> So the robot is uh, trying to determine whether it should reject a human instruction. This is very interesting, because typically when we provide explanations, it's because we want the user to accept the recommendation. But here they are looking at rejection side. I don't, I don't know if, 
I can guess, uh, uh, are you familiar with the laws of robotics? Maybe some of you are. If you haven't, uh, it's uh, in a book, uh, 1950 book, I, Robot, by Isaac Asimov. He has the three laws of, the robo of robotics, and you know, a, a robot cannot reject a human instruction unless it's hurting some, someone else. But now they are saying if the robot says no, it has to provide an explanation. Well, explanations and justifications is what we were talking in the recommender systems, in AI-based systems, in, uh, et cetera. So I think the two are now merging. It's quite interesting. This is the reference to uh, this particular quotation. Conjecture eight is really contrary to conjecture uh, number one. Uh, there are always new technologies that's going to be you know, will be challenged to understand it. I am challenged to understand this augmented reality, virtual reality. I was chatting with uh, Isaac in the back, uh, my namesake, uh, and talking about this uh, virtual room where people gather to watch a football game. I said, if I'm going to watch a football game, I go to the bar. She said, no, 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 this is very interesting, and so on. So there is a generational gap, and I must admit, uh, to me, this is a new challenge. Here's a new interface that I have to learn about. And that's fine, there's always going to be, uh, going to be a new interface. I don't know if you can read the, uh, the bottom line there. This is a blurb for a talk about the metaverse by Professor Pat Huey. I think he's from uh, Hong Kong, I'm not quite sure. But I like the, the hyperbole in selling this. We talk about the digital big bang. I, I like these uh, imaginative ideas. But here is, there's always going to be something which is contrary to conjecture number one. Uh, the ninth conjecture says, don't forget past research in HCR or anything else, because there's always good lessons for uh, the future. Now here, let me talk about uh, the survey. Uh, some of you participated. We haven't received too many responses. But first, on the left-hand side, uh, I looked at the last 12 months of the International Journal of Human Computer Studies. It's a journal that's familiar to most people. It's not purely an IS journal, it's kind of in the, in the interface. Here are some of the topics. Explanations, uh, voice-based agents, conversational agents, chatbots, a lot of that uh, today. Something that I haven't heard today, a haptic interface, you know, the touch motion. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, ro uh, robot human interactions, trust, anthropomorphism, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, let's compare this to the recent HCI sur uh, survey that we had. I think the number was, and was 18. Similar again to what uh, we were talking about today. Uh, explanations, but uh, also an interest in the adverse effects of explanations. Human AI interactions, emotions in AI in chat box conversational agents, specifically in education, uh, the metaverse, virtual worlds, avatars, bias, legal issues, and a couple maybe not quite uh, in their transitioning among interfaces. Yes, that is true, and sustainable IT. So you can see that there are a lot of common topics. Now, none of this, I guess, gives us a strong idea about kind of the future. Uh, this is what's happening today. One thing that worries me is what I used to tell my students, the crowded room problem, which means the more popular something else, there are more people in that room studying it. Uh, I mean, human AI interaction is one of them. Now, the, the challenge to uh, young scholars, uh, doctoral students is, how do you make it new and interesting? I mean, I always tell my students, it has to be, a paper has to be neutral and interesting. How do you make it if so many people are working on the same topic? But the other part is, you know, some of this issue of old wine in new bottles, explanations in uh, expert systems, advice giving, a topic that goes back to the 1970s. Technologies change, but I'm sure there are a lot of theoretical issues. We wrote a paper with Shirley Greger in 1999, I think, in MIS Quarterly about the theory of explanations. I see a lot of replications of studies done in recommend, with recommendation agents in an AI setting, uh, anthropomorphic interfaces. Uh, in 2005, we did a study, 
I don't know if this is seen where the the avatar looked like the son of Frankenstein, but still we got some interesting results. You still get the social presence and the trust, even though the image is not what you would see. Oops, uh, what you would see today. Uh, human uh, AI collaboration. Uh, who is in control? A topic that goes back to my doctoral student days. Uh, I suggest you read a book by Peter Keen and uh, Michael Scott Morton, the original DSS book, 1978. All of these notions of who is in control, they talk about that. The theory is in there. Uh, things like the laws of robotics I mentioned to you. And something I like a lot is a theory, a paper written in 1970 by Chris Argeris, who was a Harvard uh, psychologist, the double bind. So we talk about control. Let's say a professional manager gets advice from an AI system. If he or she accepts it, then that person loses self-esteem uh, because doesn't have the power. He's a professional. She's a professional. She can't do it. But if you don't accept the advice, then you are failing as a professional. So this notion of a double bind was called uh, resistance to rational management information systems in management science. Human in the loop, I think uh, Elizabeth mentioned this. Uh, ben Schneiderman talks about it quite a bit. But uh, when I was studying MIS uh, in the 1969-70s, uh, that was the whole reason of the IS area. Humans should be in the loop, right? So it's, it's uh, not a new concept, uh, but a new concept in a new uh, area, maybe. And lastly, I have to show you, because I'm a film buff, as I said, uh, talking about the metaverse, there was a Star Trek episode in 1967 where these uh, Talosians created illusions indistinguishable from reality, which is what maybe the metaverse is trying to do. And I have to show you this uh, photo where these Talosians, to show that they were intelligent, they really had uh, humongous heads. I guess that's a simple. Um, I still have a few minutes. Go for it. All right. Finally, conjecture number 10. No HCI study is complete or fully correct. But I guess you knew that. Uh, many years ago, uh, when uh, we were in uh, Boston, my wife was uh, doing research with Professor King. She's uh, in micro uh, microbiology at uh, MIT. I was walking down the infinite corridor. You heard of the infinite corridor at MIT? So this is a corridor that goes from east to west, west to east. It's a 250 meter corridor that, trans that goes through multiple buildings. And uh, you can see that on the each side of the corridor, there are these old fashioned bulletin boards, at least at the time. And as I was going down there, uh, something uh, uh, kind of caught my eye says there is no such thing as a perfect result or a complete study of a phenomenon by Professor Harold Buck Edgerton. I'm sure you haven't heard of this guy, but uh, he was known as Papa Flash because he was the discoverer of the strobe light where you have all these, uh, and also the sonar. Why am I showing you this? Uh, the reason I'm showing you this is I really believe in a cumulative programmatic study. So when I talk to uh, my new co-authors and so on, I say, if we are only going to do one study, I'm not interested because we need to plan a series of studies. So when we looked at our e-commerce research program over a 20-year uh, period, we probably had maybe 25 papers on recommended systems, maybe a total of 50 papers on e-commerce, etc. So you need to bring these studies together to fill in the uh, gaps of the earlier study. So highly recommended think about a program of research. Last two slides. The future of uh, HCI, where is the human? I'm guessing most of you have seen this, but my wife said, show it, because it's quite interesting. The factory of the future will have only two employees, a human and a dog. The human will be there to feed the dog, and the dog will be there to keep the human from Interface. 
And a final thought, which is, uh, are we interested in this? We, there is a key emo, uh, omission here. And uh, let's see if this will work. A friend of mine sent me this. So the two cats are uh, interacting with the computer. But as conjecture number two says, they are not really interacting with the computer, they are interacting with the bird. Um, so, is there any interest in it? Well, when you read the literature, there was an issue of the International Journal of Human Computer Studies, uh, what was it, February 2017, dedicated to this, and there are conferences, surprising. Anyway, uh, I won't tell you the 10 conjectures again, but let me, uh, oops, finish this. Uh, Wishing you the best for uh, success in your research projects. And what's on the second line, I think it's a Danish translation. I hope it's saying the same thing. This is okay. Great. So thank you so much, Isaac, for your uh, both informative, insightful, and entertaining presentation.